Jesus, great is highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he has the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, great is highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. He what he saith, do what he willeth. He is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, great is highest, I will come to thee. Brother Jimmy, will you lead us in prayer, please? Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the rain that we get. Uh, today, Father, we thank you for the song and message this morning. There, Father, as we learn more about your word, we can't continue to do this now. As we continue to do this, our voices to you. We have learned the rains. The rains and story we'll say it tonight. Father, we just follow you. Father, we just thank you for all that you do. We just want you to sing the prayer. Amen. All right, let's turn to page 310. Footprints of Jesus. Seen the first, second, and last verse. Page 310. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling. Come, follow me. And we see where the footprints falling lead us to thee. Footprints that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Though they lead over the cold dark mountains seeking his sheep or along by Siloam fountain helping the Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Then at last when he sees us our journey done, we will rest where the steps of Jesus in at his throne. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Alright. Now let's turn to page 325. Trust and obey. Seen the first, second, and last verse. <coughs> when we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a 
sonority can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. In the fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He says we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Good to be back in the house of the Lord this evening. Even uh, got a lot of rain this afternoon, and from what they say, we got more coming. So, uh, you know, as we continue to look into the book of Hosea, and we see as the Lord speaks in and through Hosea to the people of Israel, we find that, uh, you know, for, uh, I guess, chapters 4 or 5, he kept telling them why he was doing the things he was doing, why uh, they were, he was going to chasten them and correct them and, and those things. Chapter 6, he, he literally um, came in and uh, they kind of turned their heart or turned back to him a little. But it wasn't hard, it, it, it wasn't true. You know, they, we, we talked this morning about being able to, uh, uh, we can do a lot of things, you know, but if, the heart isn't really right in doing what you're doing, then it, you're not accomplishing much. Not in the Lord's eyes anyway. Uh, you know, the Pharisees in Jesus' day, now they love to uh, put on a show. And they would sit and uh, look good on the outside. And that's what the, the, the bitter... Uh, controversy was between Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees loved to look good on the outside, but they were just filthy on the inside in their heart. And Jesus, He could care less about the outside, but what He cared about was the inside, which was the heart. So, and the same as God here with the people of Israel. Now, back in, in the things we were doing, we know that one of their major problems that they had here is that uh, even the hierarchy of the people, the, the religious leaders of the day, the high priest and those things, now they weren't any better than the worst sinner amongst the people. And they were doing things, a, a lot of the things they were doing, for one, wasn't pleasing to God, and two, the things that they were supposed to be doing, if they were doing them at all, it was only done half-hearted. It wasn't done in the right frame, the right mind, the right heart. And, you know, literally, the Israel had lost their first love. They had left their first love, who was the Lord God of Israel. And they chased after, the people chased after 
other peoples, other tribes, other gods, all because they, it would benefit them in the things they were doing, trade, their, uh, you know, their, uh, it seemed like, boy, we, we got cha- we got going after and got in with this God over here and all of a sudden, you know, our, our crops have, have taken off and boy, we've had good weather and we've prospered and all this. They failed to realize that all of this prospering was God. Not the idols of man that these other nations and things had lifted up. You know, I, I don't, it, it's just so hard as we look back and, and we think in from today where we are, as we have God's Word, the Bible, before us, and as we can study and we can look and in and through Scripture, that we see how man put such great stock in something that man made. I mean, you know, they were uh, back in, in in this day and things, and I mean, they would they would literally carve out a god out of something. Or pour up a god out of melted whatever the they they had melted down and poured into a mold to make, and they would set it up and they would worship it like it could it had some mystical powers that could could literally do something for them. It's so hard to see how ignorant the people were about these type of things. But they would do it. You know, if... Hey, literally, I'm just using this as an example. They could say, well... All right. Here's... We have this. We have that. We have that. They're all different, right? Got three boxes of Kleenex over here. One's square, one's oblong, one's flat and rectangle. Okay? They would make this God, right? And if this God, all of a sudden, you know, if, if He didn't come through, if, if, if they worshipped Him, they prayed to this box of Kleenex and everything else, and, and if it, it didn't get them or produce for them or whatever, they'd make this one. Oh, got a new God. A new thing. they pray to it and they worship it and all these things. And if nothing happened, right? They'd make this one. You know, and and literally, it probably, I mean, you know, the process wasn't that easy or quick or whatever, but you get the idea of what I'm getting at here. This is the mindset that the people had, and yet they had left their first true God that loved them, that cared for them, that took uh, led them out of bondage, provided for them and everything else and they left their first love for what? Making their own little idol by hand and saying here's my God. It don't work. But we can look at today and we see the same things happen. People have left their first love and they've turned. They've turned to uh, the gods of this world in which we live. They turn to their retirement plans or their job or perhaps uh 
you know, they turn to the dollar or uh, or their boat or you know, big house, whatever the case is. Now I'm not, I'm just throwing things out there. It could be anything, right? Because we see that today. People will put a lot more stock into things they're doing. Oh my gosh. Here's the God of the world right here. <laughs> or people think it is. And, the, and the, the bad thing about it is if it doesn't work for them, hey. If I can't find it, I can't get it, I can't better myself on Facebook, well heck, I'll just go to Twitter or whatever all that other stuff. I have enough problem with turning my phone on. But you, you get the drift that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at here. Same was the day in Hosea's. Same was the people of Israel in Hosea's day. They were so wishy-washy, Sandra, about the things they were doing. I mean, you know, when going got tough, I mean, they didn't rely on the Lord God of Israel. They just turned to something else. And when, it, and it, when nothing happened or nothing seemed to benefit them, what they do? They just blamed it on whatever it was and make something else. The chief priests, they could care less about doing the actual job that they were set in the position for. Hey, they were just as corrupt as the people. If the people don't care, why should I beat my guns and 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 waste my breath and all these things trying to convince them uh, of, of what the the Lord God of Israel says when I can turn around, I can better myself by being just like the people. So we turn. You know, we, we, we find ourselves in chapter 7 as we began. And <coughs> we come to the point the, uh, we see that Hosea is a master painter. So far in the book of Hosea, we've seen that he is a master painter painter of word pictures. Especially of the spiritual condition of God's people during His time. In the last chapter He showed in chapter 6 that they were unavailable just like a, uh, a morning cloud that was here one minute and gone the next. In chapter 7, we find that he continues to paint some very interesting pictures. And uh, we can even direct our focus on a picture of a silly dove in verse 11 in chapter 7. And, and it says, uh, Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They called Egypt. And yet they go to Assyria. So we, we find, I mean, you know, we, we, we grasp that the people were so wishy-washy. They wouldn't stick with anything. They would call out to Egypt and yet they would go to Assyria. They had no way of, of doing anything. And we'll find that here in chapter 7, We'll find the elements or the features of perhaps a, a foul life. Uh, how they messed up, or are they are people mess up their lives? How what are the attitudes, the actions that foul us up, draw us away from the Lord? Hosea addresses these issues in chapter number seven. So even as he continues to provide 
the people of Israel now, He continues to provide them with proof like they didn't know it already. But with proof why they're in the shape they're in. You know, all I can gather is from the very beginning of Hosea, Hosea 1, verse 1, to where we are right now, is that the people of Israel were a very... They, they seem like to me they were a very dumb people. They couldn't even begin to comprehend why they're in the shape they're in, and yet it's all of their own doing. All they had to do is just stop a moment, turn around, and look at the person that stares back at them in the mirror, and they could see their faults and what the problem was. It wasn't God. It was them. And the things they were doing. We talked this morning about having union, right? And then having communion that develops out of that union. Now here, we find that, you know, the, the, they had no communion with God. And their union with God wasn't very good because they left Him and went after their own ways and their own things. So let's look. Okay, we, we see the uh, deception. Look at verse 1. It says, When, when I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered and the wickedness of Samaria for they committed falsehood and the thief cometh in and the troop of robbers spoileth without. You know, we find that Ephraim is not the particular tribe but it is synonymous with with the people of Israel. Okay? And the people are the kingdom of the ten tribes. Samaria is mentioned by name here in connection with it as the capital and the principal seat of the corruption of morals such as Judah and Jerusalem are frequently classed together by the prophets. And as soon as one sinful wound would get healed, another was discovered. And scarcely was one sin blotted out till another was committed. So I mean, it was just like they, they, they can't learn anything. You know, it, it's, it's not a person's fault because they don't know how to do something. You know, there, there, there are a lot of things out there that uh, say an individual doesn't know how to do. I mean, there are a lot of things out there I don't know how to do. All right, but it doesn't mean it's my fault because I'm ignorant to those things. Hey, it's just I've never been shown how to do it that way or how to do it. Or, or how to comprehend it, or, or whatever the case may be. All right? Well, the same is what we find here with the people of Israel. You know, they couldn't learn nothing. Little did they do, but they get into a mess, and God gets them out of a mess, and what do we find in the book of Judges? That same cycle. Where they were trusting in God, everything was great, then they turned against God, everything turned sour, their life turned bad, they prayed to God to come and rescue them, right? And then God would come and rescue them, and then everything was good for a while, and then they would turn bad, and they'd do this, and they would turn out, things would go sour, they pray to God, God would come rescue them, they would turn out good, they would then it's just a vicious cycle. They didn't learn nothing. 
people of Israel here, that's kind of what we, we gather in this thing. It, it says the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered. No sooner was it discovered than all of a sudden we have the wickedness of Samaria. I mean, it's just like, you know, people just can't, they, can, they can't learn from their mistakes. That's not God's fault. That's people's fault. You know, we're, we, we try to, to raise our kids the best we can, right? We try to bestow upon them the morals, the characteristics, and, and uh, uh, all these things. And then we, we, they, they get up, they get grown up. You know, we, we try to, to show them all these things, and then they go their separate way, and they mess up or whatever the case is. And a lot of people want to, they'll turn and they'll try to blame the parents. Hey, it's not my fault. I tried to teach him. I did teach him. Or her, or whatever the case may be. And they just didn't listen. They didn't learn the lessons. The people of Israel here, they ain't learning no lessons. They just steady, keep going and doing their own thing. You know, God's people, they foul up their lives by committing falsehoods or deceptions. They try to deceit and, and people and things. That's what we find here. It says uh, the, uh, uh, the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered the wickedness of Samaria for they commit falsehood and the thief cometh in and the troop of robbers spoil Spoil it without. So they commit falsehood, lies, deception to try to get their way, to get ahead, to get whatever. You ever knew somebody in your job that just did all they could do? They weren't really qualified, but they did all that they could do to step on, stomp on anybody and everybody else that was in line above them for a promotion so they could get it. They didn't deserve it. They didn't work for it. But what they did, they deceived their way to the top. Well, we find the people of Israel here in Samaria. It says the, the people in, in Samaria. Now, I've been to Samaria, in and through Samaria. I mean, going our way up to Jacob's well. And man, it was. It, there ain't nothing out there. I mean, you travel, you, you, you reach up and you'll hit a spot, perhaps on the road, you know, and you look and all you see is a road going out through there. If you see anything at all, you'll see a few sheep and you'll see a dog and you'll see something that looks like a... Uh, Something that comes right off of a feed the children commercial that they live in out across there. And I mean, it looks like just, I mean, boy, just something that's just about this tall, you know, and it's got a flat roof on it and it comes up, looks like a big dog house. And yet, you know, that's where people live because that's what they're doing out there. They're raising these sheep and running these sheep on these hills. I don't know what they're eating because there ain't nothing out there but rock. But these people in Samaria, now they were creating falsehood, deceptions. Well, heck, they'd have to do something out there. I mean, it, it's just pretty bad. I mean, God has some things to say about deceitfulness. After all, was it not deceitfulness and deceiving that brought sin into the world? Because that's all that the serpent did to Eve was deceive her. 
Surely, he said, you won't die. After God had told her, or told told Adam that and her that you would die. Surely you won't die. Hey, you got a pretty good point there. He created me. He wouldn't kill me just because I ate some fruit off this tree. You know, our communication is not to be deceitful. Job 27.4 says, My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Deceit cracks and cuts off our fellowship with God. Oh, it breaks communion. Psalm 101, verse 7, He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Deceitful counsel is a trait of the wicked. Proverbs 12, verse 7, The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. I mean, we saw this morning that the main problem is because we lack righteousness of the Lord. They, uh, in, in Micah's day, Israel lacked the righteousness of the Lord. Not much change. So what I said earlier is not a deceitful statement because it is true. We don't learn much. A couple of thousands of years ago until now, we haven't learned much. We're still committing the same sins. We're still doing the same things. We're still thinking in the same ways as they were in Hosea's day. The way we do it, the transmission of it, and all that, sure, that's changed. Because we got computers, and we got cell phones, and we got TV, and, and transportation to get around, and all this stuff. But the acts of sin are still the same. What was sin yesterday is still sin today. And what's sin today will still be sin tomorrow just like the Lord is the same yesterday as he is days he will be tomorrow a corrupt heart is deceitful they lack heart they they lack to walk in the good to be just to have love and mercy. Uh, Proverbs 12 and verse 20, Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but to the counselors of peace is joy. Deceitfulness is a characteristic of a fool. Proverbs 14, verse 8, The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is deceit. The wise look ahead to see what is coming. But fools deceive themselves. They tend to disregard danger or destruction thinking they will not be hurt, they will not be affected. They deceive themselves. The consequences of deceit is dissatisfaction. The people of Israel in Hosea's day, they were never satisfied. They kept seeking and seeking and seeking. Hey, if one God wouldn't work, we'd chunk him, we'd make another. He'll work. And if he don't work, we'll, we'll make another. Proverbs 20 and verse 17, Bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. Billy Sunday, great baseball player, turned evangelist. He said this, he said, Sin's sweetness soon sours. You know, it may be 
fun and thrilling at first, but soon it leaves you empty and dissatisfied. God's people were not only deceitful, but they also fouled up their lives by trying to cover their sinfulness. See, they, they, we talked this morning about the only way that the Lord's controversy could be corrected, right, would be when man determines he's a sinner. And then does something about it. They refuse to get their lives right with God. Covering sin hurts our relationship and our walk with the Lord just as it did with Adam and Eve. We find in Adam and Eve's day what they did. They ate of the apple. They, they did all the, all the bad things they were supposed to do. And then we find that when God came looking for them, the Bible tells us they hid themselves. Well, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't really understand that. I mean, you had an all-holy, all-creative God, you know, and He just made two people, and that's all you are. And uh, he, he put you in one place. It, it, it's, it's not real for certain that they could hide from God, but they tried. They made fig leaves for themselves to cover their nakedness. And God asked, well, who said you were naked? God knew. When they tried to hide from Him, when they were ashamed of themselves, what they had done. Israel now was naked. And they tried and they've been trying and they're still trying here to cover up their sin, their, their, their nakedness, their, their, uh, the, of what they're ashamed of. But God knew better. You know, trying to cover up sin, it not only hurts our relationships and our walk with the Lord just as it did with Adam and Eve, it also affects our relationship even with our family. We look through the Bible and we find that God lays out for us a number of things that happen when we try to cover up sin. And we could get into those things, but you know, we need to stick with where we are here. We find the denseness about their deeds. Look at verse 2 in, in Hosea chapter 7. It says, And they considered not in their hearts that I remembered all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my faith. The people had forgot that God realized and has seen and has been firsthand about their wickedness and their sin and their deceitfulness unto Him because they left Him to go in their own way. And there was even a point in here, I think it was back in chapter 4, I think it was, where God just said basically in, in uh, chapter 4 of the book of Hosea, fine. And He just let them go their own way. He said, that's what you want. Go ahead. And God just backed out of the picture. Now He didn't back off or He didn't back completely away. He just stepped back and let them have their own life. Say here. You don't get to learn anything, so why don't you just run your own stuff for a while and see how you get? God's people fouled up their lives by sinning so deeply 
and so boldly that their perversion surrounded them like a wave of the sea. Wherever they went, their wickedness attended them, and it became a swift witness against them. You know, it's kind of like doing something and everywhere you go, people sit back and and they're talking about what you did. <laughs> kind of like in a small town. You know? You, you go around in a small town, nobody even uses turn signals. Because everybody knows where everybody's going. They don't have no use for turn signals. Everybody knows about everybody. I know some people like that. First hand. You know, this is the type of thing that sin does to people. It brings that witness against them. No matter where they go, what they do, how they are, it always follows them. And, it, and people tend to bring it up and bring it and, and, and all these things. It wraps them into bondage. It causes them to change their attitude about sin. Solomon spoke about, out about this problem. In Proverbs 5 and verse 22, he says, His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. Bondage. They had already been freed. They had already been exodus out of bondage to Egypt. They've been taken care of in the wilderness for over 40 years. Joshua takes them into the promised land. He divides up each for each tribe and things. And then we find that you know they just continue to, to strive to go against God. When they trusted God in everything, including their battles and things, man, it was perfect. They would gain victory. They wouldn't lose any men. God took care of them. The one time that they didn't trust God in a battle was when they went against I. And they, the Bible tells us they lost 3,000 men and came running home with their tail stuck between the legs like some wolf pup. And when they got back, then it, 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 it dawned on Joshua. And Joshua repented and relented of, of, of the sin because he didn't include God in it. You know, sinful habits tend to foul up people's lives and are like links in a chain that we, for, that we forge for ourselves and eventually they turn us into slaves. You know, it, 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 it says in, if we look into this, we, we see that it says, and they consider not their hearts that I remember all their wickedness now their own doings have beset them about. Their own doings have beset them. Other people haven't done this to the people of Israel. Israel has done this to Israel. It was their fault. Their problem. It was their sin that beset them. It wasn't somebody else's stuff. It was theirs. God, in and through Hosea, was trying to tell them. He was trying to show them. He warned them over and over and over. If you don't change your ways, judgment's coming. If you don't change your ways, judgment's coming. And then finally, we see an all-gracious, all-merciful, all-patient, all-compassionate, all-kind, all-chastening uh, 
God get fed up and left man, left Israel to their self. You don't want no part of me. So when, when you figure out that you want part of me, I'll be right here. Well, you know it's the same way it is with us. You know, we only move, and I said it over and over, we only move two ways when it comes to concerning our walk with God. We move to Him or we move away from Him. It's the only way we go. You know, it's kind of like there's only two ways. You've got the broad path and the narrow way. There's, there's no middle ground in this stuff. It's either of God or it isn't. It's holy or, it is, or it's not. It's righteous or it ain't. That's all you got. There is no gray where the world likes to live. And that's what's wrong with our country today. Because we've, we've tried to walk in gray so long and in so many different things that we don't know black or white. All we know is gray. And we try to justify what we're doing by falling off whichever side of the fence is convenient for the time that we're in. That's been the downfall of America. We won't take a stand for what's right and moral and godly. But then literally, we won't take a stand for what's right or that for what's not right or what's deceitful or what is uh, ungodly. Right? We try to just justify this side by combining it with this side and walking the middle ground. <laughs> Trouble is, the middle ground, you don't get nowhere. I mean, because when you come to that fork in the road and all you've ever done is walk middle ground, you don't know which fork to take. You just stand there. You know, it's kind of like the turtle on top of the fence post. What's he going to do? This phrase, consider not in their hearts, in the Hebrew literally means they say not to their heart. Our conscience is God's voice to our heart. God speaks to our heart through His Word and the Holy Spirit. It is His Word that says, Thou shalt not. And sadly to say, it's our actions that say, but here I go anyway. When a person becomes dense, thick-headed, about their deeds and they ignore God's warnings, God's commands, God's cautions, a person will get cold and hard and numb toward the voice of the Lord in his life. We can look back. Revelation chapter 3. 
verse 14 says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with sad that thou mayest see. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock and if any man Hear my voice and open the door. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in the throne. Even as I also overcame and am set up with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. But you know what it is? It, it boils down to the fact that because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not their true condition. See, that's the problem. Israel thought that was their first mistake. They were thinking for themselves. They thought, hey, even though everything is going good, even though where we tend to, to be the, the prosperous that we've ever been and that we are increased in goods, our crops are good, we have need of nothing. They didn't know. Well, they hadn't figured out or they were ignorant to the fact that they were nothing more than wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Because the church of Laodicea is where we are right now. Not only in, in DFW Metroplex, not only in the state of Texas, not only in the, in the United States of America, but in the world today. We are in the Laodicean age. We think we're all that. But if we truly only look at the one that stares back at ourselves in the mirror when we look in there, we know that we're nothing. We're poor, wretched, miserable, blind. When a person becomes dense with their needs, ignores God's warning, commands, and caution, he gets cold, hard, and numb toward the voice of the Lord in his life. In fact, it is the foolish person that totally rejects the Lord in his heart and in his life. And sadly to say, there are a lot of, quote, born-again Christians that fit that description today. Psalm 14.1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. When people fail to listen to their hearts, they fail to consider God. And they delight from their debauchery. Look at verse 3. Hosea chapter 7 verse 3. It says, They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. 
the people they think that are their best buds, their best powers, the people that can help them the most, all that they've done is that they are so far from God that they have found happiness and entertainment from the wickedness and the lies that they're living. That's where Israel is here in Hosea's day. It's what God's been trying to tell them. Man, this is nobody's fault but yours. You brought this upon you. You brought this thing upon your own self. They were no different than uh, we could think about actors or even comedians of the day, today, that use uh, perversion to make people laugh. If they can't have a half-clad, half-naked woman on a commercial to sell something, they think they can't sell it. you got a TV show on that does nothing but increase the literal uh, uh, pushing of homosexuality in the world today and condone it as being right and acceptable to everyone. And if you don't accept it, you're a hate monger. You're, the, you're a person that just hates people. As far as I can tell, God loves everyone, but He hates the sin. But they're trying to push all that right down your throat. Our kids in school, same way. The things that they're being taught, the things that are coming up, the way that they've changed things, you can't say this and you can't say that because it may offend somebody. They take prayer out of the schools, and yet now they're trying to they're trying to teach uh, all the of the the Islamic stuff in the schools and making it mandatory that people have their kids got to go to it. No, I ain't going to it. But I don't agree with. It. But to them, they get delight from it. That's what. Uh, they're saying here in chapter 7 and verse 3. Man, the, the people of Israel, they gain delight. They have fun in it. In their wickedness and in their sin. And in these things that have brought them to the place in which they are. And they can't understand, they can't reason out why God, all holy God, has a problem. Just like in the world today, there are people and there are church factions that will turn and they'll tell you, boy, I stand up, man. We are, boy, we, we are Christians. We believe in God. We trust in God. And, and all this stuff, we believe what the Bible says. And yet, They'll condone homosexual marriages within the church. Abortion. And all a number of other stuff that has been accepted by the church. With no regard of how God thinks about it. I can tell you right now, God's not happy about it. And they will stand one day about the things that they've done and how they've done them and all. And they will answer for them. 
But I'm telling you, folks, we do not have to go along with the things we need to do is what Hosea is trying to tell the people of Israel they need to do. And it's the same thing that we talked about this morning. We have to realize some things in our lives today. And we have to realize that God has showed us what is good. And what doth the Lord require of us. That is to do justly. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with our God. And the world will tell you that all that Israel was telling God, don't worry God, we got this. We got it. No problem. I don't know why you got your bent out about us so bad. They were so ignorant of their own life and how they were living that they couldn't see the very faults as they stared them straight into the face. But we're going to stop right there. And we'll continue there. We'll pick up in verse 4 uh, as we come back uh, on Wednesday. Uh, for sure, uh, Be careful in the morning if you got to get out and go to work. They're saying it's supposed, you know, it's supposed to have all this rain and storms and whatever tonight. And it's supposed to hit again about seven in the morning and all this other stuff. So, anyway, just be careful out there as you leave tonight and as you go. We go our separate ways and all that. And, uh, trust in the Lord and to see you safely home and and those things and. We'll come back Wednesday and uh, do it all again. You know, I, I still remember the uh, the old the old saying. You know, same bat channel, same bat time. You know, uh, but we'll we'll <laughs> we'll do it right back here as as we meet back, and we'll meet we'll meet right back in the same place, doing the same thing. Amen. Trying to see what we ought to be doing for the Lord. Amen? So let's pray and we can be dismissed this evening. Dear Lord, we do come thanking You, Lord, for Your many blessings. Lord, we thank You for the privilege that we have, Lord, to, to just have a place. Lord, that we can get up and come into and to assemble together, Lord, and to worship You. Lord, there are a lot of places out in the world today where they can't do that. And Lord, we, we tend to take it for granted. But Lord, I thank You for providing us such a place, Lord, that we can come into Thy sanctuary and open Your Word and to apply the precepts of it to our heart and to our lives as we leave this place. Lord, we, we, uh, as we go into a brand new week, Lord, we ask that Your mercy and Your grace would lead us, Lord. And Lord, that as we contemplate the things we've heard today, Lord, may we just be able to apply them. And Lord, to see perhaps maybe where we failed You. And Lord, to what we need to do to, to have that communion once again with You, Lord. 
Lord, just take us from this place to our homes, or our destinations, Lord. Let us arrive there safely. Take care of us, Lord. Put that hedge about us, Lord. And let us reach uh, those places in a, a safe manner. Lord, we'll give You praise, honor, and glory for all the things You've done. Lord, the things You're doing in our lives today, Lord. And the things that we can look according to Your precious and Your holy Word, Lord, that You're going to do concerning Your children, Lord. And Lord, we just give honor and glory to You for it. For it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen.